Okay, just just uh, one one more one question from myself to Dr. Walid. Uh, we know that uh, during the first two weeks of life, a newborn TSH will be coming down from 40 to almost 50. And after those two weeks, it will become something like seven, 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 until the age of, say, one year. And then from there, it will go further, more down, which will come to about 0.25 to 5. And on the same time, there is the T3 and T4. They will be very high. It is different than the usual, the normal for adult or for small kids. It may be something like 33 or 35. So possibility of that range, that is a very normal range. We call it the normal TSH. From 40 is the cut point at birth. Then after that, two weeks later, it may become up to 14 or 15, and then it comes down. So during this time, suppose the TSH is something like 15, and the T3 and T4 are very low. How do you consider that? Did you say they are low? Yeah. So again, as I have showed in the guidelines that, uh, well, first of all, my comment is yeah. the TSH is clearly high in the first 24 hours, and that's why it's not recommended to do newborn screening in the first day or two of life, because you need to wait until that uh, postnatal peak in TSH is basically gone, and during which TSH might actually reach between 70 and 100. Uh, after 48 hours, it will continue to be high, but as you have uh, elaborated, it goes gradually down. So a 40 was the cutoff uh, level that has been agreed by all endocrine society, above which you need to treat regardless of what the free T4 or free T3 is. So a heel break TSH of 40 or above equals treatment. A venous sample of a 20 or above equals treatment, regardless of the value of T3, T4. Now we come back to free T4. Free T4 or free T3, both are basically radioimmunoassay. The, the chance of having a falsely high reading is more than to have it with the TSH. So usually you rely on the TSH more than you rely on the free T4. Nonetheless, if your patient has low free T4, irrespective of the TSH value, you have to treat. Outside those, that like the example you have mentioned, it is okay to wait for one to two weeks. It depends on how old is your infant. And then you look at the trend. If the trend is not improving, then to be on the safe side, you need to assume a congenital hypothyroidism and treat, even though this assumption might not be correct. But again, for safety, you treat and you titrate your treatment to keep the thyroid function test within the normal range, and then you can plan to wean it off around the third birthday or even earlier than that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Well, because you see, sometimes in my, I have received many kids by age of 18 months and two years. And in that, when I went back to their original thyroid function test, I found that they have been started on thyroxine for a TSH of 20 at the age of two weeks. And a T3 and T4 were normal. So those doesn't have hypothyroidism. And this, these children, they were started for maybe 18 months or two years on thyroxine. And then when I saw the original thyroid function test, I started tapering the dose of the thyroxine. And then I kept this patient even for one year and the thyroid function test is normal without thyroxine, without anything. So this is, these are the pitfalls that sometimes pediatrician or other doctor might got, get, get in. The T3 and T4, if it is low, that means that this patient is not having a good thyroid gland to produce T3 and T4. And the TSH, if there is a real hypothyroidism, the TSH would go high. It is not only 16 or 15 or 20. It will go to hundreds. So this is what uh, another thing. Now, yes. other question. 
And children, uh, when, when, when you were talking about abnormalities of the thyroid function test in kids, uh, with subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, there are kids who are by, by itself, they are obese. Now, for obesity, for obese children, does the TSH will be similar for those who are not obese? Yeah, I don't have an answer to this question. It depends on the lab assay you're using. If the reference range they provide has a BMI matched reference range, which I have never seen in my practice, then you definitely have to use it. If the lab does not have a BMI matched reference range, then you're gonna treat obese children as you treat lean children. Again, you need to look at the trend. It's, it's a good thought, but we don't have answer to it because as far as I know, there is no lab that has done a BMI matched reference range in their respective assays. Uh, Dr. Walid, I have just a comment about congenital hypothyroidism screening. Uh, I think it's very important uh, that these children uh, should be followed by a pediatric endocrinologist or, uh, for example, if another physician is going to uh, follow them, there should be uh, clear guidelines to be followed because, as you know, this is a preventable cause of mental retardation. And we've noticed that some of the children will be started on thyroxine and then they'll stop it for no reason. So it's very important to explain to the parents why are we starting the thyroxine and for how long? And uh, to explain to them if the thyroxine was not uh, continued, what will be the consequences in order to have normal uh, children? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. If, if the child is started on the, on the treatment, then the child should be referred to pediatric endocrinologist to take it over from there. I, I agree. I have one comment for Dr. Dahlia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Noor al Hassani in, uh, in my team and one of the residents did the very same study you've done. Uh, they're planning to publish this, very similar findings. So they looked at the DKA during the pandemic and they compared it to the either two or three years before the pandemic. And we found the number of DKA admitted in one year during the COVID-19 equals the total number of the previous three years. Uh, we did not, uh, we found also a difference in age. I, I looked at your data that uh, the mean age during pandemic and pre-pandemic was similar in your cohort. In our uh, hospital, they, I think they found the patients presented at younger age during the pandemic. So it's uh, interesting to know that uh, it's about the same uh, increase in number of DKA during the year of pandemic in uh, two different countries in the same region. Yes. It is very interesting, Dr. Walid, what we are finding with regards to type 1, uh, newly diagnosed children with type 1 during the pandemic. And I assume that um, also the second year, we might have even uh, further changes that might not have presented in the first year. Now, as you said, we didn't find any differences in age in the first year here in Kuwait uh, from our registry. Um, and compared to international literature as well, we didn't find any differences in, severe, in the severity of DKA. Um, I think this has been uh, due to the difference in the healthcare delivery in, in different countries. Now, Kuwait is uh, relatively um, a country where most of the population is in the city and all around the city. So the access to care was not compromised. So thankfully, during the period of the pandemic, we didn't have increase in severity of DKA. However, we had increase in the DKA uh, percentage, and that might be, uh, as I said, multifactorial. But it is um, quite interesting what we're finding with regards to uh, newly diagnosed children during the pandemic. And there is a lot of room for further research, especially after, uh, in the second year as well in the pandemic. I'm looking forward to the uh, uh, study by your colleagues uh, to take a look and hopefully compare uh, the, two, uh, the two countries in the same region. Yeah, very soon, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, at the end, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Walid Qabalan, Dr. Khadija Ali, and Dr. Uh, Dali Abdurrazzaq, and Dr. Jamal. Thank you very much, and it was a very, uh, it was a very interesting session. Thank you. I hope we'll meet again. We have some... Thank you. Pleasure to join you. Ma'asalam. Allah yisalam. Ma'asalam.